Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation on the interior of Mars as we see it by InSight. My talk today summarizes the work of many people both within the InSight science team from many institutions in Europe, the United States and elsewhere but also of course the work of engineers, technicians and other people who helped us get to Mars in the first place. My name is Simon Stehler. I'm a seismologist at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH, in Zurich. I've been working on seismometers in unusual places for a while now, be it on a bridge, inside a bridge, on the ocean floor, in a mine, but now finally Mars. So let me guide you a bit through our research on the red planet. Without any doubt, Mars is the best explored planet of the solar system. As you see, humanity has sent 47 missions over the last 61 years. A lot of them failed, especially early on, but humanity became a lot more successful recently. Mars can be reached relatively easily every other year, and since 1996 every launch window has been used. About half the missions were successful, with NASA having a specifically solid track record over the last 20 years. But other agencies, such as the European Space Agency, India, the Emirates and China, sending spacecraft to Mars routinely by now. What the first successful orbiter, Marina 9, showed us is that Mars is a dry and not obviously habitable place. On the other hand, the images showed dramatic tectonic features, such as Valles Marineris, the largest canyon in the solar system. Later orbiters, here the high-rise camera on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, showed us beautiful images of the dynamic landscape. In this image, you see tracks of dust devils, little whirlwinds. They look black in this image since dust was blown away from the surface. Hi-Rise also spotted gigantic avalanches on the cliffs in the polar regions of the planet. So the surface of Mars is still deforming today. With their expensive experience, NASA is now operating rovers continually on the Martian surface. Here, Curiosity is taking a selfie in front of the Mont Mersou rock formation. A little later, the rover even drove up the formation and got photographed from above by high-rise. At the same time, as we speak, the Shurong rover by CNSA is exploring Utopia Planitia with its ground radar, looking for example for subsurface ice layers. So why do I want to talk about another mission to you today? One that is not driving around not collecting any samples, not even taking a lot of images. That is because, while we know so much about the surface of the planet already, from images, from geological inference, from physical measurements of rock properties and composition, the interior is still a mystery. Yet this is what holds the clues to the formation of the planet and from it to the formation of the solar system as a whole. So if you compare the three planetary bodies that we know best, Earth has a core of roughly half its total radius. It's large enough that its innermost part has such high pressure that it's solid again. The process of solidification at the inner core boundary is what is driving the geodynamo that creates our magnetic field. The outer core, whereas, is fluid. Above it is a multi-layered mantle which undergoes very slow convection, which drives plate tectonics at the surface. This plate tectonics causes the diverse morphology of Earth's surface, but it also replenishes the atmosphere via outgassing at volcanoes. Life would likely not be possible without that. The Moon is much smaller and likely did not form on its own, but when a giant impactor hit Earth. Its core is tiny and it's likely that its mantle is not even completely differentiated. It's just not a real planet. Mars, whereas, formed individually, such as the Earth. But what do we actually know? It does have a core which is likely fluid, but how large is it? Is its mantle large enough to allow for convection? Why did plate tectonics never start on Mars? To answer all these questions, we first need to know how large the core is exactly, how thick the crust and lithosphere are, and what the temperature profile of the mantle is. On Earth, we answered all these questions over the last 100 years using seismology. This is the science of observing earthquakes and their signals as they pass through the planet. To do seismology on another planet, we first need a very sensitive seismometer which measures the vibrations of the Earth. Our seismometer was built by the team of Philippe Lognonier at the Institut de Physique de Globe in Paris. It's a marvel of engineering. The center instrument is hidden in an evacuated sphere and covered by multiple layers of insulation. 
but we also need to get the instrument to Mars. This is where NASA came in. As part of the discovery program, InSight was selected to be launched on a Delta V rocket from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. It was the first interplanetary mission to be launched from the West Coast, by the way. The InSight spacecraft is the little object at the top of the rocket. You see that we still would have had some spare volume, so InSight took two CubeSats along which flew past Mars to take images. So we're ready, let's go. If you know the West Coast, you know that it's foggy during the night and it's best to watch rocket launches from a mountaintop. This is what we did here. After launch, it's waiting for six months. So let's have a look where we will land and why. Inside is a low cost mission, which means that we have to rely on solar power. Because radiothermal generators use plutonium, which just makes everything complicated and expensive. To use solar power, the sun needs to be high in the sky all year round. So we need to be close to the equator. This excludes mid and high latitudes in the north and the south. Additionally, we use a parachute for braking which means that the landing site needs to be relatively low. We just could not land on a mountaintop, which excludes another large part of the planet. Then we also need a site that is flat and devoid of craters, since we want to go without an expensive sky crane as Curiosity and Perseverance were using. We therefore needed to select a landing ellipse with no large craters, and we found one in southern Elysium Planitia. Beyond that, we only knew that we would land somewhere within this 30 times 150 kilometer ellipse. On November 26, 2018, we finally landed on the planet. This is the high-rise image taken a bit after landing, showing on the left the heat shield, on the right the parachute, and in center the spacecraft with a nice blast area from the retro rockets. So we are on Mars now, and remember this is what our seismometer was looking like on Earth. And this is it on Mars, where it was placed on December 18, 2018, and will likely stay there for a very long time. But a seismometer is a delicate instrument, and it works best when it's covered. Remember, temperatures vary by more than 80 degrees centigrade over the day on Mars, and a seismometer, like everything else, will deform due to temperature. Wind on Mars can easily be 20 meters per second or more, which would be 10 before on Earth, so we need to protect the instrument. And we finally did this on day 66 of the mission. We placed a specifically designed wind and thermal shield over the instrument, which much reduces the effect of temperature changes. It also stops the wind from blowing directly at the instrument. This wind and thermal shield, or WTS as we call it, may look like a glorified bucket, but it's really a NASA high-tech product, including this very specific multiple-layer chainmail finish at the bottom. That chain mail is actually made by the same company that makes stage outfits for Madonna. Pasadena is just not very far from Hollywood. Together these mechanisms make for an awesome performance of the instrument. This is a so-called spectrogram, basically a representation of the pitch of the signal that we record over one day. The further up, the higher the pitch, and the further to the right, the later in the day. The black line in the middle is one hertz, i.e. one motion per second. Yellow colors mean louder signal, red and deep purple mean quieter times. You immediately see how the day is much more noisy than the night. This is because once the sun is up, marked by these little orange balls, the ground warms up and small turbulent wind cells form, the vertical yellow lines in the figure. Each of these wind gusts lasts not more than a few minutes, but together they make up for a lot of wind, a lot of time. Remember, each of these wind gusts can easily exceed 20 meters per second. The deep purple areas, however, are really quiet. Let us look at the color scale. I'll increase the size a bit. And now you see that it is decibel relative to 1 meter per second square. So minus 200 decibel mean 1 angstrom per second square, or 10 to the minus 10 meter per second square. In case you don't know, this is the diameter of a hydrogen atom. So during the quiet times, we would notice if somebody would slip a hydrogen atom below our sensor. This is truly quiet and shows that the French engineers really created a marvel of precision here. So what do we observe during these quiet times? Look here in the evening time window. The two boxes mark signals that are not wind. Those are actually mass quakes. They both likely happened 1500 kilometers away and had a magnitude of 2 to 3. 
This is a quake that you would probably not even feel if you were just above the epicenter. But since Mars is so quiet at night, no wind, no oceans, no street noise, we can even detect it from a large distance. Since inside landed, we have detected more than 1100 mass quakes. Most of them were just tiny quakes below magnitude 2, but some were larger and much more exciting. And this is where we start to learn something about planet Mars. This is a simple cut through Mars as it might look like. The yellow gooey thing in the middle is the core. The gray layer at the outside is the crust. And as you see, the crust varies in thickness between thin parts, such as where inside is, and the thick volcanic area, such as Tharsis. Our lander and its little seismometer is at 12 o'clock on the top, waiting for quakes to happen. And on the right, I mark a few typical source locations for mass quakes now. If a quake happens at one of these locations, its wave travel deep through the interior, and they are recorded by our seismometer. Here is a comparison of earthquakes, mass quakes, and moon quakes. Two earthquakes on top, one very nearby and one at a few thousand kilometer distance. In orange, you see the waveforms of a mass quake. Immediately, you can recognize two arrivals. These are two different kinds of seismic waves. First, the longitudinally polarized primary wave or short P wave. Then, a transversely polarized shear wave or short S wave. From the time difference between the two, we can estimate the distance of the event. The longer the separation, the further away the quake happened. At the bottom you see a moonquake, by the way. The lunar crust is so scattered by meteorite impacts that one cannot distinguish arrivals as nicely as on Earth. We are really relieved that Mars is not like that. And so from observing these direct P and S waves, we can tell how far away the quakes are. And what we found is that they really seem to focus in a few locations only. The red-orange ellipses on this map mark where mass quakes happened so far. And particularly intriguing is this one region called Cerberus Fosse. This is an image of Cerberus Fosse that was made by the Euro European Mars Express mission. It shows grabens that dis dissect the older landscape. Take care, this is not the San Andreas fault where motion happens laterally, but it clearly seems that both flanks of the graben are just moving away from another. These grabens are one of the youngest features on the Martian surface. They started to open a good 10 million years ago, and before insight, scientists were wondering whether they are still opening today or not. The fact that we found mass quakes occurring right below those grabens means that, yes, they are still opening. We do not really know yet why they are opening. Remember, Mars has no plates and no plate tectonics. So what might happen is that the enormous weight of the Elysium bulge is deforming the crust around it, causing radial fractures. These fractures are then allowing partial melting and magma to reach the surface. So this is what happens at the surface, but how can we now find out about the deep interior? For this, we need more than these direct PNS waves. We need to look for an echo from somewhere. For example, waves can be reflected from the surface of the planet. Once we have such an observation, we can try to infer the profile of the mantle, i.e. by how much seismic velocities vary with depth. Seismic velocities depend on the composition of the mantle, but foremost on the temperature profile. Warmer material is generally a bit weaker, and thus seismic velocities are lower. These are possible temperature profiles that scientists assumed before the mission, based on mineralogy and thermodynamics. A crucial parameter is the thickness of the lithosphere. The lithosphere is the crust and the solid part of the mantle below the crust, which does not allow for convection and therefore transports heat outward very slowly. In the left figure you see it as the kink between the high temperature gradients and the flatter profiles below. In the seismic velocity profile you see the bottom of the lithosphere as the kink in which the negative velocity gradient ends. The strong steps in the velocity profile at the top of the mantle, that is the transition between the crust and the mantle. It's mainly mineralogical discontinuity, which does not depend on the temperature. But coming back to the lithosphere sinosphere transition, fundamentally we did not know its depth at all. On Earth, the lithospheric thickness varies between 50 and 280 kilometers, and it's as thick as just below the very old continental cratons. There, the mantle had enough time to cool and transform into lithosphere, basically. With the data from secondary seismic phases observed during mass quakes, 
We could constrain the seismic velocities in the upper Martian mantle considerably, and from this we can estimate the thickness of the Martian lithosphere much more precisely than before. The result is that Mars seems to have a really thick lithosphere of around 500 kilometers. But if you think about it, it makes sense. Mars has no plates and therefore no plate boundaries at which new crust has created. All of Mars' crust is ancient and has cooled since a really long time. The lithosphere, so the rigid uppermost part of the mantle, is now twice as thick as it is on the oldest continents of the Earth. But we can look for more signals from the depth. Seismic waves that travel through the planet are reflected not only at the surface, but also at the interior discontinuities, such as the core mantle boundary. Specifically, if the core is liquid, shear waves cannot enter it at all and are fully reflected back to the surface, as you see in this video. These core reflected waves are like the echo in a radar or a sonar. They tell us that something is there at depth and how deep it is. In the case of Mars, they tell us that the core is surprisingly large, 1800 to 1870 kilometers. This is about the same ratio compared to the planet's radius as a whole as we find it on Earth. And as on Earth, the mantle is made of relatively light silicate rocks, while the core is made of heavy iron, nickel and siderophile elements. But Earth as a whole is much more dense than Mars. So if you do the math, you land at a core density of around 6 gram per cubic centimeter for Mars. This is much below the density of pure iron and means that the core must contain significant parts of light elements, such as hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur or carbon. And the thing is that we need a lot of light elements. This figure shows how much sulfur you need for a certain average core density, given the existence of other light elements. The blue band, for example, shows a core that has only sulfur on top of iron and nickel. The orange and green bands are compositions that contain a bit of oxygen or oxygen and a bit of hydrogen. And now let's check what the seismic data requires. Combining mantle composition, geodetic data and seismic data, we need a core density of around 6 gram per cubic centimeters. And to get that, we would need more than 30% of sulfur alone or almost 20% of sulfur plus even lighter elements. And generally, these elements should not be available in such large amounts during planetary formation compared to the composition of the Earth and what we think about the composition of Mars as we know it from Martian meteorites. And even worse, while oxygen and hydrogen can theoretically enter the core, they can also leave the planet altogether via the atmosphere during formation. Yet our seismic data shows this large core which implies the existence of these elements in the core. One explanation is that Mars just formed very early, before the solar wind had blown out all the light elements out of the inner solar system, and thus more of the light elements were available for Mars's bulk composition. Also, it could have been that Mars accumulated smaller planetary bodies from the outer solar system, which brought with them light elements. Understanding why Mars has the composition that we observe will help us understand why it formed the way it did and why it formed differently from Earth and what this means for planetary formation in general. And beyond our solar system, we now know that there is a zoo of thousands of exoplanets out there orbiting other stars, exoplanets of which we do not know more than the size and average density. If we want to infer whether they are terrestrial, whether they have a stable crust, maybe plate tectonics, or whether they might even be habitable, we need to fully understand our planetary formation models and for this we need to understand the planets in our own neighborhood. And this is where INSIGHT is happy to play its little part. If you have questions on INSIGHT Mars or seismology in general, please join our virtual Q&A session next year. The time and date can be found on the YARO homepage and in the show notes under this video. We're looking forward to your questions.